Uh. Ooh, yeah. Drop that beat. It's time to meet DP. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of DP and Me. I'm DP, aka Down Phoenix, and who's me, you ask? I'm Chris, the old ass retro gamer. The old ass retro gamer, which is kind of a weird phrase because retro already signifies that it's old. <laughs> so I'm doubly so. So you're like just the retro gamer, essentially. Yeah, that happens to be old, <laughs> but not but not the retro bro, of course. So. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how how is it going for you? Uh, it's going pretty good. Uh, my birthday just happened yesterday, and just. Having a nice old week of vacation away from work. Oh, is that why you took the vacation? Just chill for your birthday, kind of? Damn, damn right. <laughs> That's pretty nice. Uh, I actually yeah. worked on my birthday this year, but... I, mean, I, I have in the past, but I don't do that anymore. Yeah. I, I, I need my me time. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, at my old job, I was able to get my birthday off all the time because that was one of the perks was that you got your birthday day off if you... Well, unless you really wanted to work, I guess, but... Uh, Unfortunately, I don't work at that old job anymore, or fortunately, I should say, because it's a lot more stressful than what I've got now, so I'm glad to put that behind me. Yeah. So, but anyways, uh, can you tell us about your channel? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I've been doing it since 2013, and I just kind of started to do it when I got back into collecting after like a brief hiatus, because in 2011, I lost a job that I had for 11 years, and... I was unemployed for about four months and I had to sell like my entire collection that I had gathered since the late nineties to pay the bills. And I wanted to chronicle my regaining of my old collection. And I figured doing videos about it would, would be a good way to do that. And it just kind of took off from there. Wow. That's a really interesting story. I've kind of went back and forth with collecting myself. I mean, I've uh, collected all kinds of games throughout the years and got rid of them. It, it's always kind of shuffled, you know, but uh, uh, is that is that kind of how it's been with you? Or is it, has it just been like you were a major collector, then you had that uh, job event, and you had sell stuff, and then... Well, I, I hadn't collected in a long time uh, when I lost the job. I, I basically had everything I wanted, but I had a lot of stuff that nowadays is worth like a ton of money, and I sold it for like next to nothing because I just needed to pay the bills. Right. Plus, I mean, uh, things might have been worth not quite as much as they are now, too. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, I just kind of want to reclaim all the games that I had when I was a kid and growing up and in the, the 90s and 2000s. And yeah. I just it's, it's kind of become an addiction. <laughs> yeah, I definitely hear you there, man. I mean, there was tons of games that I remember getting cheap and selling them. And then, of course, the prices just kept going up. Like, I remember getting a box copy of. Uh, Gunstar Heroes for like ten dollars, and it was like yep. in mint condition, pretty much. Like it was practically the shrink wrap might have been torn off. It might have been played once or twice, and then sat in a box the rest of the time. Um, and I ended up selling it for like thirty bucks because kind of like a money situation thing. Now that game, see nowadays you be a scumbag scalper. Yeah, nowadays <laughs> that game is over a hundred bucks easy. For a oh, box yeah. copy, or at least it's pretty close to hundred dollars. I haven't like really caught up on that, but I I got mine about a year ago, and I talked some guy in, on Facebook into giving it to me for about fifty. Oh yeah, that's not too bad. Yeah, it's not too bad. It, still that wasn't for bucks. a loose copy, was it? <laughs> no, it was a complete one. Oh, okay, yeah. Because I was say if it's for a loose, I would have just went with a repro at that point. But <laughs> yeah. But anyways, um, so your channel, uh, you have you said like you said you chronicle your game collecting, your whole experience with that. Uh, but is there anything else really that goes along with that? Or, um, Well, I started off just doing like pickup videos and stuff and showing everything I was buying, but it's turned into like doing reviews and lists and collab. I, my, I, I guess the thing I'm the most known for is doing collaborations with other YouTubers. I've had ones where I've had like 10 other YouTubers mm -hmm. on one video. And that's, I guess it's kind of become my thing, but yeah. I do other things too. Yeah, I actually added that to my watch later list. I haven't had a chance to watch that yet, but I noticed that you did a collaboration with Radical Reggie, who's a YouTuber that I actually like to watch from time to time. And, oh, yeah, I just uh, actually shot a, a new video with him Monday afternoon, another Skype call video with him. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty big YouTuber. I mean, I'm actually friends with a YouTuber. I don't know if you're familiar with him, 
Uh, he used to go by Armake21. Did you do YouTube at all back in the 2008 or so era? No, I started around 2013. Okay, so he was a really popular YouTuber, angry review kind of guy uh, around the same time that AVGN and Irate Gamer got popular. He was like pretty much right behind them and subscribers. Like it was them two and then him and like Spoonie one. They were kind of like the top four for that time. And uh, I had him on my podcast, but he's no longer near the popularity that uh, he was back then, of course, because he hasn't done YouTube for a long time, for one. Mm. But um, it, it's just really interesting that, you know, I see your channel. It's kind of a small but dedicated group of people that watch it. And, you know, I see that you have a lot of the same people that comment on your videos and, and things like that. I mean, would you say that's pretty accurate? or? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's slowly growing. <laughs> Hey, as any growth is good growth. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I just find it kind of interesting that you're able to kind of, I guess, patronize with uh, some of these bigger YouTubers like Reggie, which I know Reggie's not even remotely big. When I say big, I say, like, he's the next tier up from small guys like us. Mm -hmm. But he's still in, like, a small tier at the same time, you know? Like, he's got, like, what, 15, 14,000 subs or something like that, you know? Yeah, something like There's that. There's, like, billion, like, a billion different tiers of YouTube. But you know what I mean? It's like, you don't often see... Uh, he's, like, the generation before us. Well, I have been around on YouTube for a long-ass time. I Like I said... Oh, really? Yeah, I, I've been around since 2007. Although I didn't really upload a lot of videos actually i was looking through some of my emails and stuff like that like the very first year i did youtube i only got like 11 subs <laughs> but <laughs> well, if you go back on my channel if you go like beyond the uh, the video game stuff that i all my film projects are posted on my channel mm -hmm. from like way back in like geez probably 2004 2005 type, oh. type thing yeah yeah actually the my oldest videos were ones that i did of the game the movies on pc i don't know if you're familiar with it but it was kind of oh, like yeah. a, a game where you can actually make your own movies in it so like you you were running a movie studio essentially it's a tycoon kind of game but uh i was able to make some like nice little machinima movies and i put those up on their website and then you know, whenever I started doing the YouTube thing, I was like, well, you know, I'm not really sure how to record videos, but I have these videos I did from the movies, so I'll just go ahead and upload those kind of start yeah, off. There's a Machinima series that I did on my channel, too. It was called Stranded. It was a uh, uh, Halo 2. Oh, okay. Uh, Machinima. I got you. Now, I didn't really do anything that advanced uh, as far as that, but... Uh... It was a pain that actually, in the butt. That actually requires moving cameras and things like that. Yeah, it was, it was a pain. You should have seen the weird setup I had. I had, like, a, a camcorder recording everything uh through in, the audio and video inputs and two different xboxes in the room and three different people doing things yeah it was it was a pain oh yeah well, i can imagine yeah. and you're with recording it with a camcorder to quality probably wasn't even worth all the effort but no nah, it, it looked okay i guess yeah that's pretty <laughs> but, cool so uh you also mentioned that you had a uh, podcast yourself that you started oh yeah well. we just launched it on uh, monday it's called Shh, the movie is starting and it's kind of like a mystery science theater 3000 podcast or a commentary track to a movie. Okay. And so it's not really it's, a podcast and it's no, it's, I got you. No, it's, it's more like a commentary track, but yeah. Um, for our pilot episode, it's just me and my co-host Jeremiah, who is an actor friend that I've worked with before on other film projects. And every episode after that, we bring in a guest and they pick whatever movie we watch. Okay. And, that's, uh, that's really cool. Yeah, and I've I've got some decent. I got a local guy who's in a band called the Gotsicles. He came on for like our second episode. Mm -hmm. Watch Willow. <laughs> oh, Willow! There's that's <laughs> that's a nice choice. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, great we just, movie. We had a local uh, magician named the Amazing Tomas. He came and did uh, the stuff. We did that on Monday evening. The stuff. Um, I'm not really sure if I know. About Killer that yogurt. One. Is this like a B movie kind of thing? Yeah. Or? <laughs> yeah, all the movies that we watch are from like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, he chose this stuff, which was a movie that came out mid 80s. Uh, yeah, it's about killer killer yogurt that came up from the ground. That's really interesting. <laughs> they came out. What, would that have came out before or after Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? Oh, way after. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this was like 80, 85 or 86. I want to say. Because wasn't that in the 80s? I think that if the, if it came out in the eighties, it was like probably early early eighties, like eighty eighty one, maybe okay. even seventy nine. I gotcha. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So um, since we've got the movie talk out of the way, and my show is all about games, you know, I love yeah. talking about movies, but that's just not my focus. Like I'm not really a movie buff. 
mm-hmm. uh, per se. Like, you know, I like certain kinds of movies. Like, I like the classic 80s action movies and things like that, of course, which uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later on. But um, what, what have you been playing lately? Uh, late, the newest thing I bought was uh, the Mega Man Collection 2. Oh, the Legacy Collection, yeah. Yeah, Legacy Collection. And uh, I basically wanted to pick that up because I'm not a big fan of digital download games. And okay. I always wanted to play Mega Man 9 and 10. Yeah, since... I actually wanted to <laughs> talk to you yeah. about that a little bit later. But yeah, uh, so you picked up a disc copy for uh, Xbox, PS4. What, what do you uh, For like? PS4. Is, are you exclusively PS4 or do you have the X- Xbox One? I, I have an Xbox One, but um, my collection for Xbox One is a lot smaller than my PS4. Like I have probably over 100 PS4 games and maybe 15, 16 Xbox One games. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like about my kind of thing with Xbox One. Like I have almost entirely exclusives. Yeah, or at least too. console exclusives. I have a couple of third party games like Battlefield 1. Which I bought because I was like, I had this great idea of, oh, this will be a great game for me and my brother to play because he's on Xbox and we've never played it once. And then, of course, Skyrim, um, I got it for Xbox One instead of PS4 because Sony was kind of an asshole with the way they were doing mods. And Microsoft's like, yeah, you can do all this crap with mods you want. We Sony's love like, the modding. Yeah, and Sony's like, well, you can do it kind of, you know. So I was <laughs> like, well, you know, at this point, I'm just going to get it for the Xbox, which I haven't even played it. So both purchases were worthless but yeah to, uh, yeah, to if, my if defense a, <laughs> if it's not an exclusive for the xbox one if i if it's like a multi-plat it usually means i found it like super cheap somewhere and i was like oh okay whatever yeah no oh i did i do also have rise of the tomb raider but that's a big of a different story because i bought it before it even came out on the ps4 so yeah wasn't it an exclusive for like a year on the xbone yeah well not even that it was it was also on the xbox 360 Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, and actually, it's not a bad-looking version of the game. I actually uh, considered buying it um, before because I didn't have an Xbox One originally when that game came out, but I had a 360. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so tell us about uh, Legacy Collection 2. Yeah, um, I wanted to play Mega Man 9 and 10 because I wasn't willing to download them back when they were released for like the, the PS3 and the 360. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the old-school Mega Man games, and plus I've never played Mega Man 7. Because it's, you know, $600 frickin' dollars if you want a copy of the real cartridge. So, yeah, I've been playing through them, and it's a, they're a lot of fun. They're, they're still hard as balls, man. They they Capcom left that part of it alone. But the the, the Robot Masters, their, their themes are kind of ridiculous. <laughs> oh, yeah. At that point, when you get to, like, a seventh entry of a game that's entirely dependent on coming up with all kinds of wacky themes, I mean, at that point, you're going to have to start digging at the bottom of the barrel for some yeah. of these characters. You can tell why they decided to go off and do the X series and leave the regular Mega Man series behind. They're just kind of like, yeah, we're yeah, uh, Pharaoh Man? Sure. Yeah, that's a thing. Okay, we're done now. Wasn't Let's that, move on. Wasn't that Mega Man 4? <laughs> Could have been. I don't yeah. know. That, that's that's a, Actually, that's at the point where I actually started losing interest in like the old ones. Right, I got you. Yeah, because uh, Mega Man 4 actually had Pharaoh Man, and uh, spoiler alert... Because that game is not 26 years old now, uh, <laughs> but uh, you actually use Pharaoh Man's power up to kill Doctor Wily at the end of it, and it's a charge attack. So the whole game is based on the charge mechanic, mm-hmm. which uh, was one reason I was not a huge fan of Mega Man Four. But because yeah. I mean, like you can pretty much defeat almost every boss in the game just using your regular Mega Buster, not even have to worry about the special weapons. Yeah, I remember when we got that when I was a kid, we were playing it, we were just kind of like, yeah, this is just not the same anymore. So, uh, how would you rank the uh, Mega Man games? Like, did you play through 9 and 10 completely, or what's your No, not yet. I'm still I'm still working my way through them. Yeah, I mean, everybody's got, like, kind of weird opinions with the different Mega Man games. Uh, Mega Man 7 and 8, I, I can't stand those Mega Man games. I, I have I have eight for the PS one, but I have not played it because I wanted to go through all the old games, you know, in a row, like uh, in order. Right. And uh, hasn't haven't had the time to do that yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I'm not a huge fan of uh, Mega Man seven or eight personally. I don't know if it's just because uh, they changed the art style up and the sprites got bigger and they started doing these weird things with the game mechanics. I'm I'm just not a fan of. Them. Plus, like the Robot Masters are kind of ridiculous in those games you know yeah, <laughs> um, yeah i was playing seven i was just kind of like yeah this is kind of odd 
<laughs> yeah. And then there's like this thing where Mega Man has like a kickball as a power up or something. Was that was that in a, in response to Mega Man Soccer? <laughs> yeah, that's probably where they got the idea for that game from. But uh, goal. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Mega Man 9 and 10, those are really well-made games. I love those games. Um, yeah, they feel like the old ones. They they really do. It was like I was playing them, and I was like, I've never played these before, but I feel nostalgic as hell right now. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely un- underrated. I mean, anybody that's not huge into digital downloads like yourself, you know, that never had a chance to play these games, mm-hmm. um, it, it's definitely worth it for just those games alone. And that's, yeah, that'd be the only reason I would buy it personally is just for those two games because I don't like the others. I wish that they decided to put some of the other ones on there, like maybe Mega Man and Base, or like the Wily Wars, or something like that. Oh you know, yeah, aside from w- just like the four games instead of the six that were on the original. Yeah, that would have been really nice. Um, I-, I was actually surprised they didn't just decide to go with uh, Mega Man X for the second Legacy Collection instead. Yeah, so yeah, anything. Oh, that's probably going to be the next set. Like the Legacy Collection three is going to be like the first four or five, you know, X games. Yeah. Well, then again, you never know. Met, uh, Capcom might just decide to repackage fan-made ROMs and <laughs> make that Legacy like 3. Or, or it might put uh, Mighty Number no. 9 on there. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I, have you have you beat any of the games in the collection? or Not the new one, but the old games. I, I, you beat I, all the old ones? Yeah, the old. I'd probably say 3 is my favorite. Out of the original six games? Out of the original, yeah, six games. So how would you rank them from best to worst? Uh, Probably three, two, one, five, four, and six. Hmm, that's a very interesting um, pattern there. Personally, I have to go with two, five, three, six, four, and then one. Hmm. Yeah, one I just could not stand because it's such an imbalanced game. Like it was, it's like a prototype for Mega Man Two, which obviously blew the doors off the series, you know. But yeah. uh, uh, and then of course, like a lot of people really underrate Five. There's a lot of neat uh, abilities and stage designs in Five, and I, I don't know. I just really love that game. Plus, it has probably one of my favorite Mega Man tunes ever. Uh, I used to be a huge fan of Three. But as, you know, replaying as an adult recently, I noticed, like, once you get past the original eight Robot Masters, it gets, like, ridiculously difficult out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you go to those one segments. And then when you get to the Dr. Wily Castle, that rest of the game is easy. So it's like it's like another imbalance game, too. That was, that was my first Mega Man game that I owned. That's probably why I have, like, a, a soft spot for it. Yeah, and that's how I felt about it, too. Uh, that I, was, I probably that do was need to go it. back and replay it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, that's really cool. So, personally, I've been playing Sonic Mania, which, um, you know, I obviously doesn't have a physical release yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if Sega doesn't put one out eventually. Yeah, um, I think they're, they're going to do it at some point. But even if they don't, if you can get a copy of the collector's edition with the statue, it, it's totally worth it, man. The statue what is, is the statue? Awesome. I, I haven't seen what it is. So the statue, let me go ahead and grab it real quick so I can describe it in better detail. Ooh, please do. Okay, <laughs> so the statue, it, okay, so the base of the statue, for one, this is what's really great about this here. So you have the original Sega Genesis Model 1. Nah. And, like, this, the base of the statue is that, essentially. Like, it's basically a Model 1 without the cartridge ports and... Or, what, I say ports, there's one, obviously. Without the yeah. cartridge port and without the controller ports or the video ports. But everything else is on there. You have your volume switch, your on-off switch, and then also your reset button. You even have, like, the little spots where your headphone and your cartridge, you know, your, your controllers would go in. And That's Sonic random. is standing on top of where the cartridge would be. And then, of course, it says Sonic Mania, and then it has high-definition graphics up at the top, you know. <laughs> and uh, you can actually put in, I believe, some AA batteries. So you can put two AA batteries in this thing. And uh, whenever you do that and you flick the on switch, it'll say Sega. <laughs> you know, That's it, rad. And you can just do that, like, over and over. It's awesome. And then, of course... I would, I would be doing that into the wee hours of the night. Yeah, and then, of course, Sonic himself, you know, he has kind of the cartoonish uh, style like he would in the Genesis, uh, kind of like the light blue color. He's, like, almost a foot tall. 
And uh, wow, it, it, it's not like super elaborate detail because I mean the the collector's edition is only like seventy bucks if you buy it at full bad. price. Um, but it's pretty good detail considering the cost, you know, because you're getting that plus you get the game download code and you also get like a replica game cartridge, looks like a Sega Genesis cartridge. Huh. That um, when you slide it open, it actually has like a little gold ring, just like Sonic would collect. <laughs> yeah, it's a really neat and elaborate thing. Um, I mean, anybody that would normally hold off for a physical release, I mean, if you can make that sacrifice or compromise to instead collect the awesome statue, it's definitely worth it. <laughs> as long as like, the statue isn't wearing the scarf. No, no, it's definitely not Sonic <laughs> Boom. <Sonic. laughs> Yeah, uh, but uh, but yeah, that, the statue is really cool. The only downside to it really is that it, like I said, it's not the best build quality. Like it's durable, but there's like little parts of it where uh, Sonic's like his little spikes are actually like really sharp and pointy. Huh. And I was kind of hoping that they would have melt, you know, did a better mold on the plastic so they would have like smoothed that out because like some of the bigger spikes obviously are smoother, but the small ones in the back. Are a little sharp you have to kind of be careful you know if you got kids or whatever you might want to file the spikes down or something yeah you know because they run around the house you know and get their arms like cut off because of your stupid statue yeah <laughs> sonic we're saying what were you thinking but uh anyways uh regarding sonic mania this game is a com it, it, it's really weird how i describe it because it is a complete throwback to the original genesis games Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, like, use those as a crutch. Like, it kind of evolves into its own experience, which is completely different from how Sonic 4 Episode 1 and 2 were. Are you familiar with those games? I know of them. I've never played them, though. It is completely a brand new game, but um, on some of the zones, like uh, you have some different zones that obviously originated in some of the original games, like Green Hill Zone and Chemical Plant Zone and uh, Oil Ocean Zone and things like that, for example. Mm -hmm. You do have some of those original zones, and the first act of those zones do have a lot of similarities to the original games, like... The uh, way the maps are designed and things like that are very similar. Like, it's it's almost like a deja vu kind of feeling. But <laughs> like there generations? Is, but there is, at the same time, there are subtle differences in where they place power-ups and enemies and rings and things like that that change it up. Plus, you know, you do have uh, two types of special stages in this game. You have the... Uh, style like Sonic 3 where you kind of run around that uh, globe thing, you know, trying to grab the little loose oh, spheres. Oh, yeah. The, like, fake 3D thing they were trying to do. Yeah, you do have that style, and then you also have a style that reminds me of Sonic CD's special stages. Except Ooh. except they look a lot nicer, and they run a lot, you know, a lot smoother. Huh. Um, and in those, of course, you're running uh, fast, trying to catch up to the Chaos Emerald you have to collect the blue spheres to get faster, and then you collect the rings to extend your time on those. Nice. So uh, so you do have Act 1, which is very familiar, but then Act 2 kind of adds in like a new twist or a gimmick to that existing zone. So it kind of mixes it up. Like in the chemical plant zone, for instance, there are segments in the stage where uh, the water will change different colors, like green hmm. or purple. And you can actually bounce off of it, so it's like it becomes like something you can bounce off of to reach higher places and such. That's cool. So yeah, it it, it really mixes things up, and the new stages, of course, are amazing. For well, for the most part, there's one stage I would like to complain about, which is uh, Titanic Monarch Zone, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the like the Studiopolis Zone, and then I forget what the name of the Cowboy Zone is. Like the name escapes me. Those stones are awesome 
I especially like how the cowboy zone opens up because you're actually like on the plane. You know, you have tails flying the plane and you're Sonic. And uh, so it plays like a normal Sonic stage, but you're kind of also on the plane too. You know, you're moving around and things like that. That's cool. It's a, it's a really cool mechanic that they have with that. Not to so, check it out. But yeah, Sonic uh, Mania, I did beat it, uh, you know, doing the normal playthrough with Sonic and Tails. I haven't uh, messed with, like, the Knuckles playthrough or anything like that yet, but it's a game I highly recommend if you like Sonic, because it does everything that a good Sonic game should. Like, there's people that, I know they like certain Sonic games, like uh, Sonic Generations or uh, Sonic Colors or things like that, and they're great games, but there's always, like, this little thing here or there that they miss that yeah. that the classic Genesis games do that they don't or you know something like that what no law for Sonic Boom <laughs> no uh, unless it's uh, <laughs> unless it's a Sega CD CD song of course but oh yeah yeah, yeah. which is rad <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> I love me some Sonic CD man yeah, and this game, yeah, it does have elements. It has elements of like, uh, you know, Sonic One, Sonic Two, Sonic Three, Sonic Three and Knuckles, Sonic CD. You know, it has all these different little things that they kind of throw back to uh, throughout the games, and it does does even feature a few things from the newer games, but not not too much really. Mm. That's good. Yeah, let's check it out. So, have you been playing anything else really, or? Um, I I was playing Ghost Blade HD. Never heard of it. It's uh, <laughs> it's a shmup. It's a uh, uh, vertical scrolling shmup, okay. and uh, the only place you can get it from is uh, PlayAsia. They do. They have a uh, collector's edition that I picked up, and it was only like thirty bucks, which so, is wait, not wait, bad. What system is it on? Uh, the PlayStation Four. Oh, okay, so you've been playing mainly new stuff lately. You haven't been doing yeah, a lot of retro. Yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, I mean, uh, outside of like testing the new stuff that I buy to see if it actually works or not. No, I haven't. I've I've been kind of like neglecting my retro collection lately. Uh, Ghost Just so much cool stuff coming out for the new new consoles. Ghost Blade HD. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I see it. Okay, that looks pretty cool, I guess. It is a lot of fun, especially if you're a shmup fan like I am. Is there only the uh, is there only the collector's edition? Is there not like just a disc copy? Uh, I or? don't recall if they're selling one on PlayAsia or not, but I mean, like the collector's edition. I mean, it's 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 not. It's not expensive. It's basically what you would get. Like it's basically the same price as something you would get from Limited Run Games. Um, I got and it you. comes with a it comes with a soundtrack and some. I think it came with some like baseball cards. Okay, that's pretty and, cool. That's pretty cool. And that was about and you know big oversized box and that's about it. But I mean, mm-hmm. for what you for what uh, you pay, I mean you get a lot of game for thirty bucks. Oh, it was only thirty dollars, and it was a collector's yeah. edition. That, that's pretty nice, actually. Yeah, all um, these games that PlayAsia has been releasing lately, like they're like they're doing their own version of what Limited Run Games does, and releasing mm-hmm. like their own exclusive games. And each one of them is like thirty dollars, and you get a lot with it. It's not just the game. Yeah, um, I see that they're also doing the Tachyon project. Yeah, that's the newest one, I think. And it's limited to just two thousand copies. Wow, that game mm-hmm. actually looks pretty interesting. I might have. To and they don't sell out like Limited Run does. I mean, you can go like a week later, and they'll still have copies of it. Which I mean, that could that that's a topic we'll have to touch on. But yeah. you know, I think a lot of people are probably aren't that aware of Play Asia, if you ask me. I think that's probably what um, one of the reasons behind that is, because yeah. you don't see a lot of YouTubers and things like that talk about Play Asia. Uh, whereas you see, like with Limited Run, you got like everybody from you know Metal Jesus to Pat the NES Punk and so on that they talk about Limited Run, and so the word yeah. gets out there, you know, with with them. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So uh, you said it's a vertical shmup. Is is it similar to anything particular in that kind of game series? Or um, it's or- kind of like a mix between, I would say, like Truxton and kind of like a bullet hell type of game. I mean, it's not completely bullet hellish. Okay. But I mean, you you have to stay on your toes. I mean, it is pretty hectic at times. But it it, it feels a little late, more laid back than one of those types of games. Okay. So it's yeah, not like sense. super hard. I'm going to rip my hair out. I don't have any hair to rip out anyway, but you know, it's not like frustratingly difficult, but it's it, it, like the difficulty is just right. And everything is laid out in such a way that it's easy to understand. And you know what you can shoot and what's like a background item and whatnot. And the power ups are pretty cool. And the music is phenomenal, which is why I'm glad it came with the soundtrack. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, that's definitely a plus whenever it comes to shmups. That, that is one of my favorite things when it comes to shmups is they often have, like, really good soundtracks, you know. They really, yeah, they got to uh, keep you amped up to go and just constantly press one button over and over <laughs> again for 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It looks like, unfortunately, this game is sold out, but I imagine you could probably get it digitally if you really wanted it. Or Yeah, I think it is available digitally. So, all right. That, that, it's it's well worth it. I recommend that one a lot. Yeah. Um... So, anyways, the way you described it, you said it's like Truxton slash a bullet hell shooter, but not as bad. Yeah, <laughs> um, not, as, not as frustrating. Yeah, it, it almost sounds like Musha to me with, with the way you describe it, because Musha is kind of like that already. Um, I never played Musha because it's $1,000, but um, if you've played Robo Alesta for the it reminds me of that. Yeah, you can get it off like the Wii Virtual Console if you're opposed to just pirating it. <laughs> <laughs> so... It's only like five dollars or eight dollars. Don't talk about that. Yeah. Um, or hey, just get a repro cart. You know, you can get like a repro cart. I was, cart I was thinking bucks. about it. I was really thinking about it. Yeah, uh, but it's not a thousand dollar game. If you really want a legit cart, you can get it for under two hundred bucks. Which I say, oh, that's not much. Oh, only. That, only that, yeah, that's only like a. That's only pull like that a, out of my ass real quick. Yeah, that's only gonna. Um, you know, cover a couple of months of cable bills or something like that. No big I'm deal. I'm sorry, Mr. Landlord. Your rent is going to be late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm um, trying to think. Uh, besides Sonic Mania, I've also started playing uh, because, you know, recently I played Hellblade, which um, is a fantastic game. That's that's a game. I remember that... we were chatting about that on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, you can check out the first episode of the podcast if you want to hear my thoughts on that game. But I'll just I'll just say it's it's worth playing for sure. But uh, anyways, I decided to go back and revisit uh, DMC Devil May Cry, which was made by the same developer. Because I kid you not, I see people on YouTube that to this day still complain about that game, like it was the worst game ever made. Essentially, why? Because like, his hair color was different. Well, I mean, they always, that, it's it's weird, like, I mean, I get, I get, I can get if people don't like it as much as, say, Devil May Cry 1 or 3, or maybe even 4, like, you know, I can understand if somebody might like 4 over that game more, uh, you know, just depending on their personal taste, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, there's people that literally will refuse to play Hellblade or anything else that Ninja Theory puts out. Just because, I love Ninja Theory. Just because they made DMC Devil May Cry. And I was like, you know what? I, I didn't really play it on my own system, but I had a friend that had it. And I thought it was a pretty interesting game. I liked the mechanics of it. It it did have a lot of liberties, all of it, with the uh, Devil May Cry franchise. But I think Ninja well, it's Theory... It's supposed to be like a reboot, reboot isn't it? Exactly. And uh, Ninja Theory, I thought they did kind of a really unique twist on it, you know, compared to what you would usually see with, with these reboots. Yeah. So I decided... You know, I got this game on Steam. I picked it up on, like, one of those Humble Bundle deals, and I never played it on there on the PC, so I decided I'll just go ahead and pop it in, you know, and I played it for a good hour or so, and I think it's a game I'm actually going to go ahead and try to go through. Like, I really enjoy um, a couple of things uh, with DMC Devil May Cry. First of all, the art style is amazing. Yeah. You know, this game, even on last-gen systems, has a really unique and... Uh, fascinating appearance you know it has a lot of surrealistic elements with the stage designs and and things like that which i mean the stages were cool looking in devil may cry but it was it just wasn't as imaginative it's almost like imagining that you're running gunning in like a castlevania stage or something like that which <laughs> looks really cool on its own but it's not like that imaginative whereas um it does take things kind of to the next level with this game you know it has a lot more variety in the stage designs and uh the way the stages kind of evolve and change and that game is really interesting plus i really love the red hue of that game it uses a lot of red hues and uh obviously that's a very intentional and deliberate choice yeah uh, <laughs> how long ago did you play it or did you play um it or... i never actually played it myself but i was I watched a lot of playthroughs on it on uh, YouTube because I, before I, I go and blow like sixty bucks on a game, I'll usually research it to see if you know, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. And I watched a lot of uh, YouTube videos on it. I, I I still want to buy it. I mean, didn't they release like a definitive edition for the PS4 yeah. recently? Yeah, they yeah. do have it on PS4 That's, and Xbox One. It, you can get it dirt cheap. I think it's like yeah. twenty bucks or less easily. That's been on my list, uh, and I, I'll probably pick it up pretty soon. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the gameplay is somewhat different. I guess it's not as technical as uh, the older DMC games. It's it's a little more simplified. It's almost like what they tried to do with Devil May Cry 2, mm-hmm. which I know it sounds bad by itself right everybody there. Everybody hates that just one. Just <laughs> comparing it to Devil May Cry 2 in that aspect, but it does it in a much more streamlined approach. Um, and it just has a lot more interesting mechanics to it because they actually add different weapons. Um, it's not just your uh, swords and guns in this one. You actually do have some other weapons that you can use, like a scythe and a axe. And uh, you use those weapons kind of in like a combination to kind of mix things up uh, with the combat. I like it. Yeah, because you ha- it almost has like a uh, rock, paper, scissors kind of thing where there's certain weapons that are really good in this situation and in these other situations you might get yourself hammered if you try to rely on those weapons you know against these kinds of enemies that are strong against them essentially yeah so uh, but yeah that's that's a really fun game um is it better than the others i mean i'm not gonna say that you know it, the other games have their own unique style and appeal and if you're into more of a technical aspect if you like combos that uh can really get elaborate yeah, obviously, Devil May Cry three is kind of the cream of the crop with that. You yeah, know, a but bit of a bayonetta. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or bayonetta. Of course, that's kind of like the next evolution. That was kind of like the next logical step from DMC three. Yeah, but um, but you know, if you want things a little more simple, you know, and you want just I don't know, just a simpler time, you know, I think uh, DMC Devil May Cry is definitely worth checking out. I, mean, I want yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only thing is, yeah, Dante is kind of a little bit of an edge lord in it, but I mean, come on, <laughs> come on, you're. It just makes sense in the scheme of this game. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's all I really had a chance to play. You know, I'm definitely, uh, definitely going to be checking out some new games, but that's one I'm going to try to blow through over this next week, and uh, you know, see what else comes up down the pipeline cool let me know if it's worth it oh yeah for sure Okay, so welcome back, guys, and I just want to kind of get into the game news segment here, which, uh, you know, this week we had Gamescom, which, of course, is a huge gaming event. Um, If you're not familiar with what Gamescom is, it's kind of like E3 or Tokyo Game Show, except the European version of those, and they always have it in August or so every year, and they had some big game announcements, but... The biggest thing they had, of course, was the Xbox event. Microsoft announced all kinds of things for Gamescom. Did you read into all the things that they announced? Oh, yeah, I did. So, first of all, the Xbox One X, it finally went up for pre-order. Yeah, and And, sold out almost instantly. (laughs) Yeah, which, that really surprised me. I I mean, I was surprised at how warm the reception was for that because I wasn't expecting quite the reception that it got, especially when you consider all the people that were talking about it beforehand were kind of bashing it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, everyone... Like, when the PS4 Pro came out, how everyone was complaining, like, you're getting, like, a new kind of... the original one's life cycle. Mm Mm-hmm. And a lot of people that I know, at least, were like, yeah, I don't need that. I'm okay with the the PS4 that I already have. I don't need to rebuy a system again, but... When it comes to like the Xbox One X, I don't know why, but everyone seems to be having the exact same or exact opposite attitude to it. Right. Which, I mean, they're having the exact opposite attitude of what we've seen in practice, but in 
theory, it didn't look like they were going to have that kind of attitude. They were kind of yeah. dismissive at first. So that was really interesting how that happened. Um, do you have any ideas? What, what, what's your What's your theory on that? I I'm not sure. Maybe it's the, because it actually plays 4K Blu-rays and the uh, PlayStation 4 Pro doesn't. Well, <laughs> I'm uh, sure that didn't help. I'm sure that helped, but I don't know. Um, maybe a bunch of people that were putting off buying a, an Xbox One to begin with are now figuring maybe now's the time. Yeah. And the price honestly isn't that ridiculous when you consider what it does. Which, I mean, what it does is kind of an interesting question because we do have to consider that a lot of the games that are coming for it are not exclusive games. Yeah. So it's entirely dependent on what the third-party developers decide they want to devote to it. And if they decide whether it's worth devoting those resources into a second-place platform or not. Yeah. But... Nonetheless, uh, Team Xbox has definitely stepped up to the plate so far with the uh, One X. Uh, yeah. Not so much for Team Sony, you know. Definitely not as loyal, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, but, it's just like when you see the comparisons to what a game that's going to be optimized for play on that console compared to like what it would look like on a, on a regular Xbox One. Mm -hmm. When you compare what it would look like on the Xbox One X compared to what a PS4 regular PS4 game would look like compared to the PS4 Pro, the one on the Xbox One X looks way leaps and bounds beyond the the PS4 or PS4 Pro. Well, I mean, what what games are you talking about specifically? I mean, I saw I saw the the Recore stuff, and the Recore looks like phenomenal compared to what the standard version looked like. Yeah. Well, I didn't actually get a chance to look at that one. I, I thought ReCore was fine as it was. It wasn't like... I don't think it was meant to be a graphical powerhouse, to no. be honest. It, it wasn't even like budgeted as such. It was a budget game. I think it was only like $40 when it came out. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, that's what's kind of weird about it, though, is that you have all these gamers that they made fun of the PS4 Pro doing this checkerboarded 4K or whatever. I don't even know what all this means, to be honest. <laughs> I, I, from what I understand, it, it's basically a fancy term for upscaling. Yeah. Um, like, But it was, it, it, it's obviously not the best way to put it. There's more to it than that. Like, it is native, but it's not. Whereas upscaling is not native. It's just a straight conversion. So yeah. it's, it's almost like there's certain elements that are native, uh, in the resolution and others that are being upscaled. Mm -hmm. Which I find that's kind of interesting. But, um, I just thought it was funny that they picked ReCore of all games to do that. <laughs> yeah, especially when that game didn't sell that well. A lot of the game yeah. announcements that they had were kind of weird, which um, yeah. a few of them I do want to touch in a later segment. Um, which, you know, we'll get to that. I'm sure you probably know which ones I'm talking about. Yeah, well, don't spoil I'm, it for people. No, no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, besides um, Record, they also showed off, of course, Forza 7, which that game just looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll be really interesting to see how that's going to turn out because you also have Gran Turismo Sport, which was also shown out at Gamescom. And that game similarly looks amazing, too. And it's also going to have the PlayStation VR support, which that'll be entirely interesting to see how that's going to turn out because... Um, do you, you don't happen to have the VR, I'm guessing, right? Uh, no, 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 I don't. Yeah, uh, I, <laughs> I, I think I'm literally the only person I know that has the VR that I talk to on a regular person. I, I, don't get me wrong, I want it, I just can't afford it. <laughs> yeah, which it seems like the price might start coming down on those. I hope. Because I have seen a couple of bundle deals where they're selling it down to $2.99 now. Which I'm not surprised because the Oculus Rift has started coming down in price, hmm. so I knew Sony would have to would have to eventually drop the price officially. But they'll probably wait until the holiday season, I would imagine. Yeah. But anyways, uh, it, it, it's really interesting to see that Xbox is doing well, at least according to Microsoft. You never know. This whole pre-order thing selling out in minutes or or whatever it was. Yeah, it's, it, it might have it, been because it, it they only had very spinish. <laughs> it, 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 it could be because they only had like ten thousand systems or something. Yeah, like that. <laughs> you know they could be completely. Uh, well, that's that Project Scorpio edition that comes with that stand, mm -hmm. and and is just branded Project Scorpio edition. There's really nothing different about what the retail version is going to be. 
Right. I wonder if it's going to have the FPS counter and stuff like the uh, dev kit version. That would be a pretty cool touch. Mm. But yeah, they said it sold out faster than the PS4 Pro, and I'm like, eh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. That'll be interesting to check out for sure. Um, and of course, speaking of Gamescom, there were some other announcements, not Xbox related, although I guess it technically is on Xbox. Uh, but it's related to Final Fantasy. They had all kinds of different uh, Final Fantasy announcements. Yeah, uh, that was kind of took me by surprise. Well, first of all, they had the Pocket Edition, which uh, that kind of that was a huge surprise. Yeah, because um, uh, I thought that was really interesting what they were doing with that. Uh, so essentially, the Pocket Edition, at least what it looks like to me, is kind of like uh, they're they're taking visuals similar to say World of Final Fantasy. Yeah, the kind of Where super the, deformed look. Yeah, they're kind of doing that chibi, super deformed kind of style to it. Mm -hmm. But you're essentially playing through the story of Final Fantasy 15, And it's available for iOS, Android, and Windows 10 devices, which who the hell uses a Windows 10 phone? Yeah, I, <laughs> but, I know nobody that owns a Windows phone. <laughs> I'm sure they probably only threw that in there because you can probably play it on like a tablet or a laptop or something like that. Yeah. But anyways, that looks pretty interesting. Uh, the gameplay is going to be somewhat different, of course, given the limitations of mobile platforms. Yeah. But, At least they left the cooking in it. Yeah, the cooking, of course. <laughs> I, <laughs> so that'll be interesting, to, uh, of course. Uh, I really haven't had a chance to play Final Fantasy XV much. Did Me you make either. much progress on it? or? No, I, I, when I when it comes to newer games like that, I usually will wait until they release like the definitive version, so I'm not blowing all kind of extra money on DLC and stuff like that. So that's one of the ones I've been waiting on. Okay, so you haven't even bought the game yet? Is that... No. Okay, I got you. Well, in my situation, it was kind of funny. I actually, um, you know, basically where I work, uh, once a year we get like a special discount on merchandise that we sell. And some of the things we sell, of course, are video games. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, well, you know, I'm getting this special discount and... I'll decide I'll go ahead and pick up Final Fantasy 15 because it literally just came out. And the discount even applied to the season pass. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'll go ahead and get the season pass too because I'm getting a discount on that also. Uh, so I'm going to get all the DLC when I eventually do play it. But I just, I haven't really spent a lot of time. I think I'm on like chapter three or something like that. <laughs> There's like 15 chapters, so... I need to start cracking on it, but I understand there's a lot of problems with the game and they've been doing patches and things like that. So eventually when I do get around to it, once I decide, you know what, I need to play a huge open world game, um, I'll pop that in and yeah. I'll probably have the best experience I possibly can since they'll have all these patches and all these new things added, like this other DLC that they announced, <laughs> which is completely free, by the way. Yeah, so this is really cool. Yeah, that shocks the hell out of me. Yeah, so... Um, you were actually the one that told me about this DLC, cause, so tell us all about it. Yeah, it's called the Assassin's Festival. Uh, it comes out on August 31st, and essentially it's like the Final Fantasy characters are transplanted into Assassin's Creed world. Yeah, that's really <laughs> interesting. So, like, it, 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 I've seen the gameplay trailers, yeah. and it actually has, like, these segments where it actually uses the mechanics of Final Fantasy yeah, 15 the climbing of the to climb the buildings and, and stuff like that. That's yeah, really interesting. I don't, I, I don't know what to think of that. I mean, I can understand, like, I've, I saw some, some uh, chat about it, and people were, like, complaining that that's like, not what Final Fantasy is all about. Final Fantasy is not about climbing buildings and jumping down on people's heads with knives. But <laughs> it's... I mean, do you really want to just be constantly doing the same thing in the game? To me, I mean, it sounds interesting, and it's it's kind of cool that uh, Square actually got together with Ubisoft and worked something out to let this happen to begin with. Right. And, you know. So, uh, ooh. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like a lot of people be like, "Oh, I wonder how much money Ubisoft threw at him, or something like that." Which Maybe I'm it was sure the other that's, way around. <laughs> well. You know, I doubt it was either the case. You know, I'm sure that there's actually some mutual respect between the two companies. Um, you know, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if at some point Ubisoft and Square Enix merge. Because um, the cat's out of the bag when it comes to Ubisoft. Um, are you familiar with Viv Vivendi? No, no, I'm not. Okay, so Vivendi is this huge French company that they actually used to own Blizzard Universal? Inter... 
Well, they're called Vivendi Universal, yes. Yeah. Um, but they actually used to own Blizzard and Sierra. Mm. But they ended up selling them off to Activision. And Activision kind of did this weird merger. Th it wasn't like just a straight sale. They also did this weird merger thing to where they merged with Blizzard and Sierra to create Activision Blizzard as they're now known. But mm. um, the Vindies has, has apparently had a lot of interest in getting back into the whole video game thing. And they started buying out stock and things like that in Ubisoft. And uh, a lot of people are thinking about that they might be trying to do a hostile takeover of Ubisoft. So um, I wonder if maybe this DLC might be a sign of times that maybe Ubisoft's trying to maybe warm up to some other uh, big publisher like uh, like Square Enix, for example. Buy us out first. <laughs> yeah, and maybe they're maybe they're thinking like that's kind of like the lesser of two evils, like work with a competing publisher rather than getting bought out by this huge multinational conglomerate, you know? Yeah, so. at least they might still have control over the kind of output they have. Right, and Square Enix has really demonstrated that uh, uh, that with Eidos, because they kind of took over Eidos. And, but they still uh, let them do their thing. Yeah, for more or less. I mean, yeah. Square Enix did do some kind of messed up stuff with, like, uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, but yeah. for the most part, they've done pretty good. Uh, with I mean, the Tomb Raider stuff, I mean, come on. Oh, yeah, exactly. And uh, so I wonder if that could be something going on or if maybe I'm just reading too much into that. Uh, it could be a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, interesting enough, this wasn't even the first time that uh, Square Enix and Ubisoft have worked together on Final Fantasy DLC. Mm -hmm. Because Final Fantasy XIII 2, a.k.a. the sequel that nobody played because they hated the first game. You mean you mean uh, Final Hallway? <laughs> Uh, it had character DLC from uh, both Assassin's Creed and Mass Effect. So you were actually able to make uh, one of the characters in Final Fantasy XIII 2 look like Ezio from Assassin's Creed 2. That's cool. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Yeah. Square Enix is uh, really uh, having fun with these DLC things. But they're hey, not. I just love that you can see a Chocobo running through Assassin's Creed world. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, instead of the horse or whatever. Yeah, that is rad. You know, but maybe instead of diving into a bale of haze, you just dive into a bunch of cactuars and you come out with <laughs> the spikes all over you. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, Square Enix isn't the only people that have fun with DLC because uh, Netherrealm... They like to have fun with this stuff too, of course. You know, oh they, yeah. They just recently released Injustice Two uh, back in May, and that game has kind of been tearing the charts up with fighting games. Like this has been one of the best-selling fighting games, basically since uh, pro probably since Mortal Kombat X. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Um, but they have some new DLC fighters, uh, of course, coming out. We have uh, Raiden, of course, from Mortal Kombat. He's finally coming. Because why not? Yeah, because, I mean, we already had uh, Sub-Zero, right? Yeah. And so yeah. it just kind of makes sense to add somebody else. And Raiden has not had a lot of love with the uh, Mortal Kombat franchise lately, so it's really good to see him on there. Um, I don't know about the model they're using, though, because it looks like they gave him 3D glasses. <laughs> maybe it's just the glasses for the Eclipse. Or maybe he's just old and he, he has poor vision. Yeah. Glaucoma. <laughs> 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 so uh but we also had uh who else was it uh we had a uh, black, black manta yeah black manta of course uh i'm That's not really aquaman's villains right villains, right which i mean gallery. it just makes sense because you had the aquaman movie coming out uh, yeah, that's basically year. what that is. <laughs> that's basically just an advertising tool that they're using. Right, uh, but the last one was one that uh, kind of took me by surprise a bit because we really you haven't... You me both. <laughs> yeah, because we really haven't heard a lot about this uh, this one lately. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're they're bringing Hellboy into it. Yeah, which that, that's really cool. I really liked uh, uh, the Hellboy comics. I wasn't a huge fan of like the movies... But it was still really cool. I, I liked Ron Perlman, essentially. Ron Perlman yeah. was great. The movies were okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering if them bringing Hellboy into this game, knowing how popular Injustice 2 is right now, they're using it as an advertisement tool for the reboot of the Hellboy movies that they're talking about making right now. Which, that, that could be possible. I mean, you also have that the fact that Spawn, they're trying to reboot Spawn, uh, yeah. Todd McFarlane, 
is trying to kind of bring that back, but he wants to complete total creative control. He doesn't want to sacrifice any of that. Oh, I can understand why. <laughs> yeah, I saw that movie. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people did. That was back when the uh, superhero movies uh, were not a dime a dozen. No, nope, that was uh, a the- year before Blade, and Blade kind of revitalized it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but uh, not not just that though. But they they weren't common, and when they no. did happen, they often weren't very good to begin no. with. So Superman that's why. 4. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Superman kind of created that buzz for a little while, and then it also killed it off too. Yeah, basically, Batman brought it back for a little while, but. That didn't last. It, again, Batman kind of killed it off with yep. Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. <laughs> oh, God. But, um, yeah, so that's that's really interesting to see, especially considering that uh, Hellboy isn't even a DC Comics character. Yeah, that's, uh, what is it, Dark Horse? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was Dark Horse or if it was, like, Image or something like that. Yeah, I think, yeah, Image is uh, Spawn, Dark Horse is is Hellboy. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So, hey, if they got a new Spawn movie coming out, why don't they re-release uh, Soul Calibur 2 with Spawn in it for the Xbox One? Backwards compatibility. <laughs> Great idea. Great idea, indeed. <laughs> uh, so, speaking of the original Xbox, you know, there was a game series that... A lot of people really liked back on it. They only had the one title out of two, and it was just just happened to be the sequel, but the original Xbox had Shenmue 2. Yep. And then of course we had the first game on the Dreamcast. And mm-hmm. those and of course we also had Shenmue 2 on the Dreamcast, but we didn't yeah, get that, that was version. Only Pal, that was, Pal yeah. in Japan. But those were literally the only releases of those games. They never re-released them or nothing. Nope. So clearly whenever they did the Kickstarter two years ago for Shenmue 3, a lot of fans were really hyped up and they wanted to back this game. Oh yeah. They wanted to that make was like that one made like a million dollars in one night, didn't it? I, I don't know what what the final I don't know what what it was that happened in the first night, but it it did set a record, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And it ended up closing around somewhere north of six million dollars, which is a lot for a kickstarted game. Oh yeah, um, not a lot by game budget standards, but from what I understood, apparently Sony was also flipping some money, and they had some other minor investment things. So I'm sure the game's probably got a decent budget. It's it's still being considered like an indie game, though. I don't know why, but <laughs> well, it's just because it's you know not tied to a major publisher and yeah. things like that. Except it is sort of now. <laughs> yeah, because apparently Deep Silver is going to be publishing it. I understand. Yep. But the main news uh, bit with this, of course, is they released a new teaser trailer for Shenmue 3. And it's been getting quite a bit of backlash, I've noticed. Yeah, I, I'm not... I don't understand it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's been like two ne- two years since the Kickstarter with very little news on this game. It's been pretty slow on the news front. Yeah. Which it seems like a common theme with Kickstarter games. Like, let's announce a Kickstarter game and have all this hype behind it, and then be and then quiet it for like for a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, be quiet for like two years, and then when we show it off, it looks like a disaster. You know, it's yeah, like worry every different. single person for a straight year that donated money that they wasted their cash, <laughs> but, and then um, come out of nowhere with a teaser trailer. But of course, you know that that's that's happened with Mighty Number no. Nine. It's kind of sort of happened, although not to such an extreme degree with Bloodstained. Is that even still coming? Yeah, it got pushed back to next year. Oh, okay. And they also I changed anything about that in a long time. They also changed developers and they canceled the Wii U version. Oh, well, obviously. But not, <laughs> but not the Vita version, strangely enough, for some reason. That's kind of weird. What? Okay. Yeah. But yeah, whatever. <laughs> <Whatevs>. <laughs> well, because, you know, people are still playing that in Japan, I guess. Yeah. Hey, I still play mine. Oh yeah, I'd love, I'd love to be. I actually own two Vitas. Nice. Because uh, I have the original, which I have in Kaku on that one, and then I've got a uh, slim model too, which that's ah. kind of the one I use for legit games like downloads and PlayStation Plus and things like that. Nice. But uh, so there's been a lot of complaints with the Shinmu Three trailer, mainly because of one, the graphics, um, like the, with the way the facial expressions are and things like that way the faces look 
essentially mm-hmm. like a lot of people compare it to like a high resolution Dreamcast game. Yeah. And of course, I'll give, I'll the, give it that. <laughs> and of course, the animation as well. Yeah. You know, like it, it, it just looked kind of choppy and stiff. Yeah, I mean, it definitely uh, definitely looked rough around the edges. I'm not gonna yeah. beat around the bush with that. I mean, I don't. I th- I think that whether you're looking forward to the game or not, whether the teaser appealed to you or not, I think pretty much anybody can agree that yeah, the graphics weren't the best. Yeah, the animation could use some work. But those but, environments, though, those environments that they were showing off looked phenomenal, I thought. Which, yeah, they looked great. Of course, the game's running on Unreal Engine 4, so it's kind of tough to see how much of that is in the actual developers. Yeah, I mean, it's still in development. Engine. Maybe they were working on just, like, more, more working on the environmental type stuff, and they just have, like, placeholders in there for the characters at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard some theories about that. As a matter of fact, I think somebody... I was watching somebody on YouTube... And they were talking about that. Uh, that's what, essentially what uh, some of those character models and stuff were. They are placeholders. Yeah, like they that's, have. That's, a a kind of, that's what I got out of it, at least. Like they kind of wanted to do the teaser, kind of to update fans and just let them know, hey, we're still working on this game. Yeah. So I think that's likely. I mean, in, in this case, uh, Yu Suzuki, he's got tons of industry experience. He's been making video games for over thirty years. I trust them. At this point, yes, there's been some people that have done some shady things like Inafune, but Mm -hmm. we can't judge everybody as that they're going to do the same thing just because they're making some of the same mistakes. So for the time being... One guy ruined it for everybody. Yeah. For the time being, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Although that, that, uh, that late... What was that that thing they were doing? That late bloomer thing that they were doing for Shenmue 3 where if you didn't donate to the Kickstarter and you still wanted to you could donate money but you're not going to get any perks uh yeah the slacker backer campaign yeah that was what it was I um, remember that being kind of shady well it wasn't that you weren't going to get any perks but you weren't going to get any of the extras like you were essentially just buying yourself a copy of the game like a digital yeah. or a physical copy depending on how much you contributed like you weren't going to get some of the extras like the Kickstarter exclusive DLC and things like that I think that's what the controversy with that was about ah which i mean if it's labeled as kickstarter exclusive yeah that makes sense i mean (laughs) that means it's exclusive to that you shouldn't expect to get that somewhere else Now it's time to take a break for everything that people wanted to talk about, and let's talk about the news nobody cares about! And now it's time for the news that nobody cares about, because there's a lot of gaming topics that happen all throughout the week, and somebody's got to cover them, because, you know, it has to be talked about, but nobody cares about these things. So first of all, at Gamescom, of course, we had the huge Xbox event, and Nintendo kind of showed off some things and whatnot. Sony made this huge deal hyping up this huge reveal for something. And everybody is thinking, oh shoot, they're going to announce the PS5 or they're going to announce a sequel to the Vita or, you know, something like that. I even theorize, you know what, they're probably going to come out with a PlayStation 4 Pro, but one that has a 4K Blu-ray drive. And maybe they were going <laughs> to drop the price of the original one and, you know, do all these things to compete with the uh, Xbox One X. But what do they make this huge deal about, you might ask? A new oh controller. And it's not even a Sony controller. It's just an officially licensed controller, which is fancy words for third-party controller. So there's this company called Nacon. They make... Uh, no, they're called Nacon. <laughs> Nacon. I, I know. I know. <laughs> okay. So uh, interestingly enough, with the PlayStation 4, there is literally only one other controller maker besides Sony, and that's Nacon. I, I, or I think Razer might also have a controller as well. But, like, they're very strict in controlling with their controllers, unlike with Xbox. You know, you have very few options when it comes to PlayStation 4 controllers. But anyways, Nacon has their new Revolution 2 controller that's coming out for the PS4, which it's essentially like an Xbox controller, but with PlayStation buttons. And it has, like, some of those macro buttons on the back and stuff like that. And then it also has a terrible D-pad. Yeah. So... Uh, but yeah, that's coming. 
Yay? Sony Sony made <laughs> Sony Sony made such a huge hype thing on Twitter, and then it's like this controller with a crappy dubstep trailer. <laughs> boom, chicka, boom. Which of course is a sign for the times, and then of course we got Mass Effect Andromeda. Everybody loves Mass Effect Andromeda, not. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I still haven't played it, so I can't. I can't cut. <laughs> there's people that, of course, uh, still want to play more of it, and unfortunately, Bioware said, "Well, unless you're playing multiplayer, you're not getting any DLC because womp womp. <laughs> we're going to release a game unfinished and having all these problems, so that it doesn't sell as good as it can." And then we'll just use that excuse for not releasing DLC. But we'll still release the multiplayer DLC, even though nobody's going to play multiplayer for a game that's not getting supported anymore. Yeah. But you're still getting a multiplayer DLC, at least. Yay? And then, of course, uh, of course, <laughs> with the whole Gamescom event, Xbox, like I said, they had some games that uh, probably took some people by surprise. World of Tanks. <laughs> World of Tanks. No. Well, I mean, I guess nobody really cares about that either, but <laughs> that's not where I was going to go with. Uh, no, they have the um, they have three new games coming out that are Xbox One X supported. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, got the 4K and HDR and all that good stuff. And they also support the Kinect for Xbox One, which I was just like, what? There's literally, yes, please. There's literally not been a official game that supported that accessory for, like, three years. What was the last one, that Fantasia game? Yeah, and that came out, like, in the middle of 2014 yeah, or something Yeah, that was like not that. too long after it launched, I thought. <laughs> right, and then I think there was, like, a couple of indie games that supported it since, and then it's been, like, dead. I was looking at yeah. the Wikipedia, looking at the Xbox 360 Connect. They had nearly 200 games that were announced, or that were launched for the Xbox 360 Connect. The Xbox One Connect only had 22 games that used it in any capacity other than just voice chat, which I guess oh you can use it as God. a mic for voice chat or whatever. But yeah, uh. but yeah, so you have um, and they're all remasters, too. You have a new version of Zoo Tycoon, which was an Xbox One launch title. Yeah. And then you also have uh, Disneyland Adventures. And then there's like another Disney theme game. I forget what it's called, but. If you got an Xbox One Connect, which I actually do, <laughs> um, but I use it as a webcam, <laughs> not as an Xbox. Oh, I thought you were going to say you use it as a weapon. <laughs> no, I use it as a webcam because I have the One S. So in order to even use the Connect, you have to buy the forty dollar adapter thing, which is a mess to set up. Jeez. Um, but yeah, I, I use it as a PC webcam because I got to connect itself for like nine dollars because GameStop had this crazy promo going on. And I got it. Dirty. Uh -huh. Oh, oh so, I know what you're talking about. Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that. It was before oh. that. But oh. Uh, oh. I, I stand corrected. And then, of course, in other news, we have a new game coming out next week. Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle for the Switch, which oh, looks yeah. amazing. I really love that kind of gameplay. And I'm going to eventually get it. But I did have to cancel my uh, pre-order just because I'm not going to have time to get to it right now. But it's going to have a season pass. Is it a multiplayer game? I, I'm not really sure about that. I think it does have some elements of it, but it's going to have a season pass. I'm not sure why that's news. Yeah? <laughs> Considering that most major releases have a season pass now. Oh, okay. But, yeah, that's news. And then, of course, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's $20, so it's not, like, terribly expensive, I guess. So that, that's okay. Um, so, in other news, if anybody that has an NVIDIA Shield out there, Guess what? You don't have to emulate Metal Gear Solid 2 on your NVIDIA Shield anymore because they're coming out with an official release for Metal Gear Solid 2 HD for the NVIDIA Shield. Oh. Not Metal Gear Solid 1, not Metal Gear Solid 3, Metal Gear Solid 2. The black sheep of the main games. Well, Raiden. well maybe Metal Gear Solid 5, depending on who you ask. <laughs> Still haven't played it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So that's the news that nobody cares about because somebody's got to talk about it. It might as well be me. Woohoo! All right, so let's go ahead and get into a uh, discussion that we talked about last week. Well, no, we didn't talk about it. I talked about it. You probably heard it somewhere. I listened. I listened. So um, let's talk about the limited run thing 
because a lot has actually been going on since I had my uh, discussion with Limited Run. Um, actually, you kind of brought it to my attention. Did you um, have anything you want to say about Limited Run, like the whole thing that's been going on with them lately? Or Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people had problems getting a copy of Wonder Boy, mm-hmm. but I, I honestly didn't. I couldn't really complain. I did have a problem with getting a copy of Night Trap. Right, so and... were you unable to get one? or? Yeah, and it was it was bizarre because um, I usually have to do the afternoon sell through because yeah. I'm at work during the day and I usually have I'm nowhere near a computer. So I honestly I put it in my cart and within a minute of going into checkout, it was it was taken out of my cart. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people were saying it sold out in two minutes. For me, it was less than a minute. I mean, I don't understand it, and I understand now that people are getting. Certain people are getting advanced access to uh, some of these games. I really, I haven't heard that. Names. Yeah, I've, I've I've heard talk that certain uh, certain people are getting advanced access, and that's why they're selling out like they are. Hmm. I wonder and... if uh, they might be giving priority because they want to make sure that certain people end up getting copies of these games so that they can maybe talk about them for promotional reasons. Yeah, I don't. I don't know names of the people who are getting them, but I'm talking about uh, I think that that's kind of shitty. <laughs> which, that would surprise me if that's what's going on, because Limited Run has announced previously that whenever they do make batches of games, they they make more than what they say they're going to sell. Oh, yeah. Because they, like, they'll actually send copies out to stores and stuff like that. Right, yeah, they actually do that. As a matter of fact, I think Pink Gorilla Games, that's the store that uh, Kelsey runs. You know, Kelsey Lewin uh, or whatever. She's... Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. She's she, she's on some of Metal Jesus videos. Yeah, but uh, uh, but yeah, her her store had had uh, is actually gonna be having some limited run games for sale recently. Yeah, I was talking to Reggie on Monday when we did our video, and I mentioned that out of all of the recent games that they've sold through limited run, one of the ones I was regretful that I wasn't able to get was Oceanhorn. Right. And he's like, "Oh, wait a minute! You know, I hear Kelsey, or yeah, Kelsey might be getting a copy of it, so I might be able to get you you one through her." Nice. So that's that that's that's cool. <laughs> so, and I know they they also have tables at conventions, and they have like copies and copies of other games that they have sold in the past available to just buy in the flesh. Right. Which I mean, like I said, they they have some extra copies that they have for purposes like that, for promotional reasons, mm-hmm. also to replace any games that might get damaged in the mail or go yeah. missing or something like that. So so that's all fine and dandy, but. Um, they are going to be doing things a little bit differently with this upcoming pre-order that they're doing yeah. this week for Ease Origins, which... Yes! <laughs> I'm actually happy they're doing this. I think this is a really good compromise, what they're doing. I think mm-hmm. this is kind of like the best overall compromise they could have made, but even still, a lot of people are still complaining, which I just don't even understand why they're complaining. It's because, of, it's because of the version of the game that they compromised. Which... Th- that's the thing, though. The version of the game they're compromising is the one that they should if they yeah. had to compromise between one or the other. Yeah. But um, and, so, and I'm, I'm in complete agreement that this is the one that they should be doing that for. Right. So essentially what they're doing, like usually when they have a release, they'll announce whatever games are going to be selling. They always sell them at the same time on a Friday, one time in the morning, one time in the evening. And they will do them in, like, they'll basically split the batches. Yeah. I don't know if they do it exactly in half or if one time slot gets slightly more than the other or whatever it is. But once those sell out, that's it. You know, that's, yep. it's done. Your SOL. <laughs> so, but um, what they're doing with this one, Ease Origins, for both the Vita and the PlayStation 4, whenever they go on sale... They're going to have the collector's editions for each of them, which I think they're limited to like 3,000 units each. Yeah. And I don't know if I maybe misread the email um, that I got from Lunar Run, but it looked like the collector's edition for the Vita is going to cost the same as the regular. I saw that. I, I'm wondering if they fixed that because uh, someone pointed it out on Facebook. I do believe today I noticed it. Yeah, I'm sure that's got to be an error, but oh yeah, if... Um, <laughs> You know, it comes to the pre-order time, which we're recording this the day before this goes live, uh, which this episode is recording go- is going live by the time it's probably over with. Mm-hmm. But um, 
if that is the case, and it does happen to be the same price that it showed in the email, I'll go with the collector's edition for the Vita. That sounds yeah. fine to me. Why not? <laughs> but if it does turn out to be a mistake, I'll probably just decide, you know what? I don't want to deal with the hassle. I don't want to fight the cart. I'm just going to go ahead and drop an order on the uh, regular edition. Because what yeah. they're doing is they're leaving it open for 24 hours. Anybody that orders it is going to get a copy. The catch, of course, is you have to order it within that 24-hour window. Otherwise, you're not getting it unless somebody decides they want to sell their copy on eBay or something like that later. Yep. So I think that's a pretty good compromise because the collector's edition is still going to be a, a rare release. That'll be for collectors. People that just want to have everything. You know, that mm -hmm. they want to have the game to add to their collection. For people that just want a physical game to play, if they can't get the collector's edition, they can still get the regular edition. They can still play the game. That's my plan. <laughs> So I think that's that's a great compromise, but some people are like saying they're gonna boycott Limited Run now because they're doing this one-time thing, which they might they might just be experimenting, you know? Because yeah. you never know if the next several runs that they're gonna do are gonna be like the traditional model they've done. I know the the other game that they're releasing tomorrow is was it As Divine Hearts? Yeah, it's like a mobile phone and, RPG. Who cares? Yeah, and, and yeah, <laughs> but I mean they're doing the standard thing with that. Right, yeah, which yes. uh, I, I, with that one, I'll be shocked if it sells out that day. Yeah, I know I know. N++ didn't sell out immediately. I know it was available hours and hours after Yeah, yeah it was, <laughs> they went on sale. Uh, yeah, I think that one finally sold out like a couple of days ago. Yeah. So it, it's actually been on sale for several days before it sold out. So, but I mean, I like this. I like this pre-order idea, especially for this game, because I know this one is going to be the one that is quite popular. Because I mean, it's this long-running RPG series. Yeah, and it's so a, it's a series everyone has that, a chance to get it. It's a series that back in the day was never popular here. No, uh, but it's kind of started to build a reputation. It's kind of been growing here. Thanks and to now, the happy console gamer. <laughs> he's, he's definitely contributed for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it, it'll be interesting to see. I really, I hope Let It Run announces what their final sales figures are with it. Because mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what kind of actual demand that they have for like a, a fairly big size release for them. As opposed to what they have been selling. You know, because maybe they're using this as data to see if they can gauge how many units they should make to where they can make as many people as possible happy yeah i mean the whole name of the game is making money but at the same time remaining limited i guess yeah i mean so. i don't know it's it's a cool idea i hope they do it for a few more just to try it out but i mean i would like you said i would love to see what like the final tally is how many copies were pre-ordered mm -hmm. in the end yeah you know it'll be really strange if it ends up being a small number like if some if like if they say they only sell like 4500 or something like that the regular edition i'll be mm -hmm. like that's really strange because <laughs> yeah. that's like less than what you sold for night trap and wonder boy and those sold out in minutes yeah so, but you know it'll be interesting to see what happens with that and what i what if it goes over twenty thousand? right then people will be like oh it's just just like a regular release at gamestop it's no longer <laughs> <laughs> but, but then that's not it, counting that uh, limited edition version. Right. Uh, so speaking of not making people happy, <laughs> there's Blizzard apparently pissed off the whole country of <laughs> Australia inadvertently with uh, one of their recent DLC uh, releases. So, um, oh, for, God. <laughs> so Overwatch, they have this new map called Junkerstown or, or something like that. Um, did you read up about this story, really? Or? Yeah, I did, and it's very silly. <laughs> I mean, I was just like, this has to be a joke, right? Like, it. That's what it came off as to me. <laughs> you know, but, uh, okay, so this map is set in Australia. It's, it's, a, it's a Junkertown map. I'm guessing that this particular map, which, if I'm not mistaken, th this, no, this isn't even a new map. I've played this map before when I used to play Overwatch. But there is a sign in the map <laughs> that says takeout. 
But whenever Australians, okay, take out, of course, in case you're not familiar, is what it's usually called whenever you're ordering Chinese food or pizza or something like that, and you go and pick up the food yeah. and then bring it home. That's takeout. You know, essentially, you take it out of the place to eat it wherever you're going to eat it. But in Australia, they replace the word out with away. They take away the food to wherever they're going to eat it instead. But they use takeout instead. And how dare Blizzard be so culturally insensitive what do I say? as to do something like that? Oh my God. Apparently nobody at Blizzard understands Australian culture. And Jeff yeah, Kaplan yeah, right. had to apologize for this. And this is such an old thing. Like, did people just realize that this was a thing or something? It's not like there was a billboard in the game that said, Crikey! Yeah, okay, maybe this map isn't... Maybe this is a new map. Okay. Because I was looking at some of the screenshots in this article. I was like, I played this map before, but then I'm looking at other ones. Like, this looks familiar, so I'm wondering if maybe they changed the map up in some way. Like a reordered version of it? Yeah, like maybe they're changing around some things, like some elements to the maps. They have done that before in Overwatch, so... Yeah. But takeaway, yeah. <laughs> I, I, snowflakes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's take away from this entire story. Yeah, what, and... what do you take away from this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, we, are, we are culturally insensitive to our to our dining needs. Yeah, exactly. So this is a great time to go into the rapid fire this or that. This is a segment where I ask you questions really quick. You have to spout out your answers as quickly as possible, or we're just going to have to hit the buzzard on you, because come on. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get right into this segment. Uh, for people that aren't aware, I ask our friend um, Chris, the old-ass retro gamer, what he prefers between one or the other. And then, of course, it kind of goes in a path depending on that. I actually prepared this time. Uh, but anyways, let's go ahead and get right into it. So Challenge accepted. Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Predator or Total Recall? Total Recall. Which game, Predator or Total Recall? Uh, to, to Predator. <laughs> Sorry, you got the buzzard on that one. <laughs> but let's go ahead and go on that path here. So since you chose Predator, Journey to Silius or Terminator for the Sega CD? Terminator. All right. In that case... Would you say that you'd go with Junior or Jingle All the Way? Junior. You heard it here, people. Christopher likes Junior. Yeah, because <laughs> of the one scene where he gets the, the labor paint. Oh, shit! <laughs> it's not a tumor. <laughs> yeah. Who said you could take my cookies? Oh, great. Put that cookie down, now! Oh, man, you're so good at those voices. Um, <laughs> you should do some voices. Yeah, do some more. Do some more. Oh, God. You, you think you're a fucking choir boy compared to me? A choir boy! That's very good. Can you, um, <laughs> can you ad-lib it a bit? Like, could you say, subscribe to the DP and Me podcast on iTunes in an Arnold Schwarzenegger voice? I, I, I can try. <laughs> yes. <laughs> subscribe to the DP and Me on the iTunes. Do now! Alright, sounds great. <laughs> Get to the chopper! Yeah, get to the chopper and pre or er, Get to the iTunes! <laughs> uh, and that's where we're having too much fun. It's time to finally uh, start wrapping things up and getting into the main topic here. Because there is a pre-order gaffe that has been taking the world by storm. Mm. Yeah, it's been <laughs> talked about everywhere, pretty much. Ad I mean, nauseum. <laughs> I've seen people that I never see talk about video games on Facebook talk about this. So people Nintendo are supporters on Facebook that are normally defending everything they do are like turning on them. 
Well, there's still some supporters that are, like, defending everything they do regardless, but but it seems like every time Nintendo does something really messed up, a few supporters get chipped away and get yeah. into the skeptical crowd. Uh, because we have had the Super Nintendo Classic pre-orders go live recently. Um, yep. And, and they did all kinds of weird things with this. I mean, first of all, we had Best Buy... As well as, uh, who was the other one? Amazon, I think it was. I think they were like the first two that did it, right? I think so. Well, well, before then, we had the whole Walmart thing that happened like last month. Yeah. And then they canceled everybody's pre-orders, mine included. <laughs> that was just a complete mess there. Uh, but, you know, I'll give it that that probably wasn't intentional. I think Walmart just kind of jumped the gun. You know, maybe uh, somebody clicked the wrong button and it accidentally went live. Yeah. That's that's what my thinking was. Yeah. But uh, Best Buy, Amazon, they both go live at the same time. Now, mind you, like all of these places that were doing these pre-orders, they had alerts that you could sign up for mm-hmm. to be notified whenever it's ready to pre-order. And like nobody got these alerts. I didn't get any. I, I like put alerts on like GameStop and Walmart and uh, Amazon. I never saw an email. So... <laughs> But anyways, I never, I never signed up. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, you had uh, Best Buy and Amazon. They go live like in the middle of the night without any warning. <laughs> so if I would like if I if Nintendo was would have sent out a tweet like, hey, uh, pre-orders going live on Best Buy at this time, you know, stay up and pre-order. If I would have got that notice, I would have at least tried to do it. But I can imagine. But I was sleeping because, you know, I have a job to go to in the morning. <laughs> so, obviously, I Most missed out. Most of the fibers aren't up at 2 in the morning. Exactly. And a lot of other people missed out on it for that reason. Some others, they happened to be there at the time. But due to low inventory supplies, it sold out in minutes. And so, by the time they actually got to the checkout process, their carts got emptied because they sold out already. Oh, Night Trap. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like the whole limited run flashbacks thing. here. Ooh. It's like the whole limited run thing, but on a much grander scale. Like yeah. we're not talking about a few thousand people fighting for no. a smaller set of copies. We're probably talking about tens of thousands of people trying to compete at once to get oh yeah what there is. So obviously it becomes a mess, and then we have like um, Game Stops. Like okay, yeah, pre orders are live now. And then, like, oh, not on our website, though. You have to actually go in the store. Go to the store. I remember <laughs> And yeah. so you have, like, these huge lines of people, like, on, on social media. They're trying to pre-order their uh, Super Nintendo Classic. And, of course, they only had, like, a few, just like they did with the NES Classic. But, of course, that uh, so that's a complete mess, of course. But it's GameStop. I mean, if uh, Best Buy and Amazon are going to screw up, why not GameStop? I mean. <laughs> well, what a, is it different from any other day? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. That seems like a normal day at GameStop. Yeah, and then of that's course, that's just how GameStop do. Yeah, so I'm not going to give them too much flack. They they do what they do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and then of course yeah. we have, <laughs> of course we had Target, which they apparently had a whole bunch of issues with their website conveniently at that time. I don't know if it's just because of the traffic or because their site sucks, but yeah, you know, Target. <laughs> yeah. Not the not the hot destination to pre-order the SNES Classic apparently. Not my first choice. Right, and then of course Walmart. You figure Walmart screwed up once already; they would do a better job. But again, they screwed up. Yep. May not be entirely their fault, of course. Like I said, this could be a whole Nintendo thing. Like, okay, we're gonna give you guys five thousand systems to put up. Good luck with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, you know, maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe most of these units are going to be going to stores for the launch events. Could be, yeah. That's what, that's what my guess is. So, uh, you know, of course, at least with those other three, Target, Walmart, GameStop, they at least waited until the morning. So I'll give them credit there. Yeah. So. But uh, on top of that... I've been reading reports that there's people that bought these bots. They're like called Dai Ting bots or something like that. Uh, tai, tai Ding. Tai Ding. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And um, they, 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 I guess they're like software bots that people can program to do various things on the internet. And one of the things that people chose to do in this case 
was they programmed these bots to basically look for any reference of Super Nintendo Classic pre-orders. And they pre-program their payment information and credentials and everything like that. So these bots can like go in there and quickly order these systems. And I guess they can also program multiple accounts too. So they can pre-order multiple systems at the same time. Yep. And as we see now, there's a whole bunch of SNES classics available to purchase on eBay. Yeah, and they haven't even had them in hand yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're probably just going to strip ship it straight from um you know, from wherever they're buying it from to the person they're selling it to. Yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> doubt it. Ah, uh, good times. But of yeah. course, uh, technology. Which I guess maybe the number of listings have went down. I don't know if uh, eBay or anyone like that's trying to mess with it, but uh, there's like over 100 and something listings for this thing. But it seems like half of them are for, like, ra Raspberry Pis and modded Xboxes and things like that, too. So, <laughs> I don't even know how a modded Xbox comes under SNES Classic, but... I, I don't understand the way eBay works sometimes, either. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, there's, like, a PSP that's modded. If somebody's selling for 125 bucks. a PSP, come on. PSPs are super easy to mod. It takes, like, five <laughs> minutes. Ugh. But, uh, yeah, this, that's a thing, of course. I mean, these Tai Ding bots. Apparently, they were also a problem with the uh, NES Classic as well. Yeah, that's why I stayed away. When I heard about all the, the crap going on with the NES Classic, I just said, yeah, I'm not all that interested in dealing with any of that crap for the SNES Classic. Right. But apparently, with this Tai Ding thing, there was one safe measure that all these companies could have practiced. I think they're going to start doing it now that, that they know. <laughs> well, I don't think it really matters to these companies who buys them. No. So I don't know if that'll change or not. The only reason I would see them changing that is if it helps the security of the actual website. Mm. So uh, what I'm talking about specifically is a tight ding bot cannot get past CAPTCHA. Like even <laughs> the the, one thing. <laughs> it, well, obviously you have the CAPTCHA where you have to type those letters and things like that or clicking on yeah. the panels or whatever. Obviously, that's going to be challenging for a bot to get past. I'm not going to deny that. But there's a caption where there's just like, I am not a robot. You just have to click, click that checkbox. <laughs> yep. You can't even get past that yet. <laughs> so this bot does not have the ability to get past that. But these websites, none of them use this CAPTCHA feature. Which shocks the hell out of me. Which, I mean... I. I think I actually have seen it used before on, like, GameStop site before. But it seems like it's only triggered if you're placing multiple orders within a short period of time. Mm. So, and, and that might have even been a fluke. I don't know. Maybe I'm just remembering it wrong. But, Maybe uh, they used it at one, time, at one point in time, but they don't anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's something weird has gone on with that. Uh, but in any case... That's something that could easily defeat this bot. Of course, the developers of the bot have talked about that they are trying to figure out a way to get past that stuff. Um, because, you know, I mean, hackers got to hack, right? Got to do it before the uh, N64 classic comes out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I remember seeing a tweet from somebody that said, like, instead of like complaining about the SNES classic not being able to get it, I'm preemptively down about not getting the N64 class. <laughs> I was like, so true. But just the fact that someone actually said, I need to create something like this so I can buy myself an SNES classic. is kind of like, yeah, yeah, uh, you need to find a better way to spend your time. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> like, you can play real SNES, for example, or just use oh. an emulator if you got it. You know, whatever you got to do to play your Super Nintendo games, there's tons of ways to do it. But it's all about that Star Fox 2, yo. <laughs> but you can download the ROM on the internet. Yeah. I, I guarantee you somebody's going to have that ROM dumped of what's on the, the actual day thing. Of. <laughs> well, maybe the day of. I think it might take a little bit of time because it did take like a couple of weeks, I think, before they actually hacked the NES Classic. Oh, was it? Yeah, I, if I remember right, I think it took like two weeks hmm. or so. Uh, <sighs> I, I actually never did it myself on mine. I mean, I saw how you to actually, do it. You and actually it was... managed to find one? Oh, I bought the NES Classic at launch. I sat in line for like uh, six hours. 
God damn. Yeah, which obviously, <laughs> if I want to get an SNES Classic, I'm going to sit in line a lot longer than that this time. Cause That's think, some amiibo devotion right there. Well, I think at that time, I don't think everybody realized that the NES Classic was going to be such short supply. Yeah. And uh, now that they know what Nintendo is capable of, and they know that Nintendo is not really doing a better job this time around, I think people will try to come more prepared if they really want it. But then again, you got to think about, remember how it was the same with uh, all the Amiibos when they were first making them? Mm -hmm. And there was all those shortages and everyone was like going to a Target at three in the morning and standing in line so they can get a freaking Zelda Amiibo. Right. I'm wondering if I'm wondering if like they're they're just gonna like make it short uh, shortages at the beginning of the the run of this thing, and then like towards the end, just like flood the market with it, like they're doing now with the Amiibos. Well, that's what I was thinking. Like whenever they started the NES Classic, like whenever I heard about the shortages, I was thinking, well, maybe Nintendo's holding stock back for Black Friday. Yeah. But then Black Friday came and like Nothing. we barely saw anything. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I didn't see any more at my store until, like, two weeks after Black Friday. And it was, like, three. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, I remember, like, towards the end uh, of the NES Classic, you know, before they announced they were going to cancel it, I would go to the Best Buy over here in Chicago, and they'd have a few of them sitting on the shelf, and no one would be touching them. Yeah. And now it's, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there, there was, like, a short period around, like, February to March where I would regularly see at least one or two in the shelves. But then when they announced that it was canceled, like it was impossible to find Yeah. at that point. And I used to have the NES Classic. I ended up selling mine, which I know some people were like, oh, scumbag reseller. What? <laughs> but the thing is, I paid $60 for it. I had my fun. It was sitting in a box, and I wasn't playing it anymore. And I probably would have started playing it again eventually, but... Yeah, I figure I've got a Super Nintendo. I've got it RGB modded because I have the uh, SNES Junior. Mm -hmm. So I have the original hardware if I want to play that way. And if I want to emulate, I've got a bunch of emulators. I got a Raspberry Pi. I've got a PC. I've got a modded Wii. So like, I have all these different ways to play Super N or NES. So like, um, do oh well, wait oh I'm thinking the Super Nintendo I had are okay no my NES is just a regular NES the regular toaster style mm -hmm. or not toaster the VCR I don't know what I'm calling it, toaster the, <laughs> the toaster would be the yeah the, yeah the front loader not the top loader the top loader would be the toaster because that's how toasters are designed uh, but I've heard people call the original model the toaster for some reason I'm not sure I don't know I guess it's because of the lever action you know. Kind of like, kind of like with the toaster. Yeah, exactly. That might be the theory there. Um, but uh, anyways, I had my fun with it, and they canceled it, and they were going for ridiculous amounts on eBay. Yeah. So I, I still have my box in great condition. I have my poster. I had all this stuff with it, and I love the poster. I, I contemplated selling it without the poster. But I was thinking, well, you know what? That's probably I'm probably gonna knock some money off the the price in. Um, and so I ended up selling it for like $220. God damn! Which, I mean, this is for a used one. One that's been played <laughs> for a few months. And then put back in the box. That's not bad. It, it didn't even... No. I, I, and you know what? I didn't even have the original micro USB cable anymore. I apparently <laughs> lost it. I just, I just like, you know what? I'll just throw in a random one. You know, I, but I put it in the description, of course, that it's not the original one. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I made my money back and then some, because, you know what? Excuse I decided, me. hey, why not uh, use those money, use that money on things that I do want, uh, that, I can't, gotta, that I can't regularly play with stuff that I already have. Gotta sell the games to get the games. Exactly. So, um, hopefully people, like, understand my reasoning behind selling it. Not everybody wants to do it, of course. Some people want to, you know, keep it for years to come because they really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but at the same time, I don't think I enjoyed it enough that I needed to keep it. I, I, I thought it was better to find a new home, and since somebody is willing to cop up the money, I'm not going to stop them. See? That means you're automatically not a scumbag reseller. Yeah, I'm just a scumbag. <laughs> no. <laughs> so... See, I just I just didn't see the need to get it because I basically 
in cartridge form that were on it already, so I didn't feel like buying all the same games all over again. Right. I, I guess at least um, with uh, with this one, you do have an unreleased game. That's That would be the only reason I, I go after NES Classic, which is just so I could play Star Fox 2. Right. Because it's honestly, doing it this way, buying the, the, the SNES Classic, is cheaper than buying a repro of Star Fox 2. Is it cheaper, really? The repros for Star Fox 2, because you have to have that uh, FX chip 2, and I think the only way you can get that is if you cannibalize a copy of what is uh, Stunt Race Effects for the SNES. And so, like, the repros are going for like 100, 120. No, it can't even be that because it has to have the Super FX 2 chip. And that, yeah. that game only has the one. Was it? There's Well, there's I know there's like one specific cartridge you need. Yeah. Uh, I think and it might have been Dirt Race Effects. Was it Dirt Race? Yeah, okay. I'm pretty sure. Which that's actually a really common game. But uh, yeah, like the if you want a complete inbox version, which is what I would go, it's like oh, okay. 100, 100 to 125. Maybe a cartridge alone would be like 75. Well, but do you really need a complete inbox when it's not even an official game to be getting with? You're getting hey, a man. repro card in. I like my, pro, my, like my collection organized in a specific way, okay? Okay. But yeah, <laughs> you're like right. It, like. it, is, it is a little on the pricey side. I see on yeah. eBay, it looks like it's going for about 60 bucks, roughly. Yeah. So, yeah, you're definitely spending a lot if you want an actual cartridge of it. I mean, mm -hmm. at that point, you can spend, like, maybe another 40 or 50 bucks and get a Super Nintendo EverDrive. Or, wait, no, I guess you couldn't play Super FX games with that. I forgot. Yeah. No. Well, just download it on an emulator if you don't want to spend money on it. Yeah. <laughs> or play Star I mean, Fox Command, which is essentially the same game except advanced, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love Star Fox Command. Like that's I, I have the, it for the DS. I think it's fun. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people will crap on that game, but I thought it was really interesting the way it played. Yeah. And I thought the touchscreen controls actually worked pretty good. I mm -hmm. was surprised at how responsive they were. Uh, I guess it would have been great, of course, if it did have more traditional controls, but I, I wasn't really that bothered by it. Yeah, I thought it was fun. Now, and it, it was also like ridiculously hard too, man. Like I, I think it took me like probably six or seven tries just to get past stage two, <laughs> like the second stage that you play in the game, man. Because you have to do things a very particular way. Not only do you have to be skilled with the controls, but you also have to be like strategic in the way you play it too. Well, yeah, it is more like a strategy game. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was that was a pretty nice game. But yeah, there you go with that. Um, so just you know, speaking of that, of course, I did want to also discuss clone systems just in general because if you think about it, the SNES Classic is technically a clone yeah. of the original. They're emulating the original game system. They're emulating themselves. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, Sega is trying to do their own thing with At Games. They have the At Games Genesis flashback, and you know, there's all kinds of other clones. Like clone systems seem to be the hot button thing right now in the community. I mean, hell, there was like three different NES clone systems that are like forty dollars at all out output in HDMI. Yeah, that came out. No, this no year. one gives a shit about those. Well, um, so what, what's your take on the clone systems? I, I, I they don't really interest me. <laughs> Is it just because you had the original hardware? Yeah, I'm. I've never really been. I mean, like, I have like an emulation machine, but I'm like, when it comes to like these like flashback machines, I just. I mean, I don't know. They it, just don't really interest okay. me. <laughs> well, what, what do you use as an emulation machine? I have a, I have a Retro Freak. Oh, okay. That's the one that's like the uh, Retron 5, right? The Japan It's like a Japanese Retron 5, essentially. Yeah, and then on top of playing all the games that that does, it also plays TurboGrafx-16, PC Engine, yeah. and uh, Super Graphics games, and all in outputs in HD. Right, but the downside, of course, is you don't have a actual NES cartridge slot. No, I guess... but they've they've released an official adapter. <laughs> okay, well, couldn't you also just use that Famicom adapter thing too? Or yeah, does yeah. It not, does that not work? I have I I had to buy when I bought the system. I had to buy a Famicom to NES. Oh, okay. So did, was it? Did you buy one that was like specially made for this system, or was? Oh it no, no, no. They they have one now. Uh, when I bought the console, it, it was right around the time it was, and they didn't have the official version yet. So I just bought one off of eBay for like twenty bucks. Okay, so you could use just a regular Famicom adapter. Like you could just buy that, or you can rip open a cart like Gyromite or something like that, and just yeah. take it out of that. Okay, that's honestly what that the one I bought looks like is like one of those ones that we inside. Right? 
Right, which I know there's like all kinds of like weird ways to tell like which NES carts use the adapter. Like a, the, depending on the number of screws they are and all these other weird <laughs> things. I, and it's, it's weird because like on some of them it describes all these ways to find out if it's one that does it or not. And then even if it matches all those criteria, it may not actually have the adapter still. So it's like, are you sure there's really a rhyme or reason to it? I mean, yeah, <laughs> I don't but, know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, so the retro freak, um, I can you tell me about what your thoughts were on that? I I really like it. Um, they just released an adapter for that that plays Game Gear. Uh, what is it? Mark three. Mm-hmm. and SG-1000 games. And if you have an adapter that lets you play Master System games on an SG-1000... No, not no, the... Sorry, Mark III to Master System, you can actually play your Master System games on it, too. Mm-hmm. That well, also Mark- means that your console is now, like, two and a half feet tall. Well, isn't the uh, Mark III... Isn't that the, the Master Mark III System? The Mark is the Japanese Master System, yeah. Right, okay, but then they but did... The, re- they did the regular- cartridges are smaller. They're actually smaller in dimension. Yeah, the the cartridges look just like the SG one thousand cartridges. They just hold more memory. Okay, but this so the cartridges themselves are smaller. The wide the master system cartridges are a lot wider. They don't even fit onto the uh, the adapter. Okay, yeah, because the master system cartridges, remember right? They were a little bit bigger than the Genesis cartridges. Like yeah, they were yeah. closer in width to the NES cartridges, but they were kind of short like the Genesis ones. Picture an Atari twenty six hundred cartridge. That's the size of a. SG-1000 or uh, Mark III cartridge. Uh, but yeah, the it, it, I I think it's fantastic. I basically use that whenever I want a retro game. If it's I mean if it's not a disc based game, but all my stuff, how I capture my footage for my videos. That's how I play all my retro stuff. I basically have all of my consoles for all the ones that the retro freak emulates in my closet i haven't okay. even taken them out you know what I, i've got i've got a couple of things that i'm at to tear you down on that since you're using a device that emulates mm-hmm. but you're using the original cartridges yeah like what's the point of using this to emulate it as opposed to just opening up snes 9x or something like that on your pc and just recording it that way because you're emulating either way yeah Technically. Yeah. Uh, I just don't like doing it that way. <laughs> I mean, it, do you think it's like a placebo effect thing? Like, it's because you're using the original cart and the original controller? Or... Yeah. I mean... Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I, I... Honestly, I'm not a computer gamer. I don't like gaming on my my Mac. Well, mostly because my Mac doesn't play games very well. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. For some reason, I just... I, I like the old school feel of playing on hardware right like not, well, i know it's not the original hardware but you know playing from the cart with a controller you know okay. on a tv which i get the cartridge thing because there's really not a substitution for that on a pc i guess you can get a rom dumper and you could hook that up to your pc and put the cartridge in and dump the rom and then oh, you I can, can act i like can rip <laughs> all of my cartridges and put it on a memory card retro freak and then bring the memory card over to my computer and probably play those through and then really really wanted to (laughs) right right exactly i mean you could do that of course and you can actually do the opposite from understand too i heard the retro freak unlike the retron doesn't have any security measure with that so you can actually just download roms off the internet put them on the sd card and play them through the retro freak yes unless they updated it or something to where you can't do that. no it it, it does all that because uh one of the videos i did was where i was reviewing the game gear adapter thing and uh, I don't own any SG-1000 games, so the only way I could, you know, test them out to talk about them in the video was to download the ROMs and, you know, play them through the Retro Freak, and it worked perfectly fine. I had no problems. Hmm. Yeah, which I know the SG-1000, they're kind of simple games. I I, I would it's, probably... It's essentially them. a ColecoVision. <laughs> yeah, I would say they're very similar in the way they look to ColecoVision, I've noticed, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I've got like pretty much the whole Sega Genesis Master System SG-1000. I have like all the ROMs on the computer. I just downloaded like the complete ROM sets and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I do like playing on the original hardware. I had an EverDrive that I used for my uh, Genesis Model 1. And that was a really great way to play uh, games, of course. I think with the Genesis more so than other systems for me, uh, I really like the way the Genesis controller plays Genesis games. 
Yeah. As opposed to like with other systems, like with the Super Nintendo and Nintendo and such, I'm perfectly fine playing those on like an Xbox or PlayStation kind of controller. I'm not like too picky on those. But with the Genesis, I really like the classic three button layout for the Genesis. And I like the way the pad just feels. Yeah, it's, it, it, it fits in the hand very nicely. Yeah. And so, I don't know... And plus, with the way that con- game controllers usually are, like the Xbox and PlayStation controllers, they don't really have, like, the proper layout for a three-button uh, setup. Yeah. Like, you're almost, like... You, al- you you pretty much have to get a Genesis-type controller, like a USB Genesis or Saturn controller, to um, get that kind of feel on, on a PC or, you know, Retro Pi or something like that. Mm-hmm. That's the one complaint I have about the Retro Freak is that it comes with a USB controller that is sort of modeled after a Super Nintendo controller. But right. there's an adapter you could buy that has inputs for all the different controllers that it emulates. And I end up using that more often than the built-in controller because that thing is... I mean, it's not bad for certain games, but like you said, when it comes to like Genesis games, that the layout is like so funky. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not even worth trying. <laughs> Right, I gotcha. I mean, which if it's a six-button Genesis controller game, you know, I, I think I'm usually okay with using something like that because I really don't like the six-button quite as much. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know if Sega was trying to uh, maybe keep, like, get the controller size down a little bit to maybe appeal to younger gamers more or something like that. Or Yeah, it was, it was extremely small when compared to the original three-button. Yeah, which the Saturn addressed that. The Saturn six-button love... is pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, that, that one's pretty nice. That's If I had to do a six-button controller, I would want one that's shaped kind of like the Saturn. Yep. Uh, yep. But, uh, yeah, as far as me, when it comes to, like, clone systems, I really haven't had a lot of experience myself with them. But, uh, of course, there is the whole At Games Genesis flashback, which I'm kind of confused about what's going on with that, because I hear a lot of... I, I, when I first heard people were reviewing this thing... Like, I saw, like, uh, John Hancock and a couple other people, like, I think uh, they were, like, praising this thing in a way, like, at least more so than I expected, considering the reputation At Games has had. Like, they had some complaints, but they weren't, like, huge complaints, you know? They're, like, I I think most people can get over these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then, like, everybody started ripping it apart. Like, once it seemed like sites like IGN were starting to talk about this thing... And then you had other YouTubers like Review Tech USA and all these other people like started ripping it apart, you know. And I was like, wow, you know, like, so is John Hancock wrong? Because I mean, I, I really value John Hancock's opinions on things, you know, like, yeah, that, that like dude he, is, he, he knows his shit. Yeah, he seems like he knows what he's talking about when it comes to emulation and things like that. And uh, he'll, he'll bash something if it's bad, you know, like, I mean, he, he doesn't beat around the bush like some of these people. Like, there's other YouTubers that I like watching. That, you know, they do really good videos. Like, I like their news discussions and things like that. But when it comes to reviewing a product, they don't really say much negative about a product at all. And it's like, I can't really trust their opinion on it because they're kind of downplaying everything that's wrong with it. So what are they saying is wrong with this this Genesis thing? Is it like the the emulations aren't good on it or? Well, yeah, there's a very there's various things. Uh, Some complaints about the controller response. Um, the way the controller has the batteries, because it uses like double A or triple A batteries or something like that, it actually has a screw that you have to undo to put the batteries in and out. Which, whenever I I, I, I kind of complain about that a bit, but whenever I heard somebody else's perspective, it's like, well, if you got kids, <laughs> you kind of yeah. want that to be, because otherwise you have to worry about them damaging the battery compartment and all this other crap, you know? So I was like, and it's okay. unusable. Yeah, so I, I, that, that kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, so I think that's something that could be worked around. Uh, maybe it would have been better if they could have had a rechargeable battery built in, but yeah, that would have been nice. That would have obviously increased costs. Uh, emulation yeah. issues, of course, uh, a lot of slowdown on some certain games. Uh, some games don't want to work at all, of course. Hmm. Um, also, it apparently has problems with dumping the ROMs because it does like the Retron or the Retro Freak, where it'll, like when you put the cartridge in, it, it'll dump the ROM to the system. Yeah. And it apparently has a lot of problems with that. And you can't, unlike the Retron, you can't hot dump a ROM. You have to restart the system every time you want to change cartridges. Hmm. So apparently it does have a number of problems. But at least it has actual good sound compared to the other hack game systems. Which, oh man, they're so terrible. Have you heard 
those other at game systems, man? No, no. Uh, just man, like just, Tinny. <laughs> yeah, just just watch a YouTube video of like at games Sonic or something like that, man. It sounds terrible. <laughs> That was uh, one of the things I looked into when I was going to buy my Retro Freak was I know that like the Retron 5 had troubles with audio a lot of times with mm-hmm. like the music and games and whatnot. And I did a lot of research, you know, because I was going back and forth between Retron 5 or Retro Freak. And it turns out the Retro Freak has the most success when it comes to that area. Like there was no problems really with the emulations of the games. I have honestly, all of the games I have in my collection, I have not noticed one issue yeah you haven't noticed anything that like was off no like, sounds off sound, no graphics yeah. no slow no extra slowdown no nothing yeah that's nice that's nice that's I mean, that's surprised the hell out of me right and in which case i mean yeah whether it's emulation or real you know as long as you're getting a good experience out of it you know i think that's what people really will remember when it you know comes down to it yeah uh but uh there is another genesis uh console it's like a cheap chinese one that uh (laughs) is designed to look like a model one genesis and this thing apparently is actually legit from what i've heard i've heard this is like other than like the model one genesis itself it's like the best way to play genesis games really so if you're wanting one that has like actual hdmi output and things like that it's it's a solid contender as a matter of fact john hancock is actually uh, this is the now the John Hancock podcast apparently because I mentioned him twice <laughs> in a video. Uh, but uh, we love you, John. Yeah, but anyways, um, he's actually didn't do an interview of it. Um, it's just called the HD Retro something or other. It looks like a Sega Genesis. It doesn't have any kind of Sega branding, and he uh, heard about it in AliExpress. But apparently, this thing's pretty legit in the way it's designed, and I'm kind of interested to see what he thinks about it because i've heard some good news about it uh um, and it probably costs two dollars and 76 cents <laughs> no it doesn't do that but no. apparently it does pretty solid handling of the games um unlike the uh, at games when it doesn't dump the rom it actually plays off the cartridge so you get instant loading uh you don't have to wait for the rom to dump or anything like that which that's really nice, nice. and it also has it doesn't have any built-in games unlike the at game one but then again, that means you're not getting a whole bunch of crappy, like, mobile games or whatever the hell they're supposed to be on there either. So. Snake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it apparently it will even play uh, Master System games, and it works with EverDrives and, um, like, multi-cards and stuff like that, too. Well, that's good. So, yeah, this thing seems legit because, you know, the... the at games one can't work with either of those kinds of things so. so is it the same dimensions as a standard genesis was oh yeah yeah this one's apparently so like the, the really... power base converter would fit on it then uh i'm not sure how that would work i know that they said that master system games do work through an everdrive oh okay okay i imagine the power base converter would probably work because literally the genesis at least you know the genesis has the master system built in yeah because the sound processor is the master system yep. essentially <laughs> and so you know because i know with my model one i was able to use the everdrive to play master system games even though i didn't have a power base converter so literally that's just nothing more than a cartridge adapter yep so massive I, one at that <laughs> right um and it's really curious how expensive that thing is whenever back in the day i think they sold it for like 20 or 30 bucks yeah it was like I, a dirt I cheap think. accessory Nowadays it's like what, uh, almost a hundred bucks? Yeah, or more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's got to a point where like Stone Age Gamer has started making their own like knockoff of it, <laughs> so that uh, you know they can kind of cash in on it just because of how expensive that thing is. Good for them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that's all we really have time for. Um, I don't know. You have anything else you want to discuss or? No, I I think uh, I've said all I need to say. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, plug you just one more time. Uh, you're Chris, the old ass retro gamer on YouTube, and then you also have, uh, or I guess you also go by Christopher Pico on YouTube. Yeah, right? the name of my channel is Christopher Pico. Right, and then of course you also have that podcast called Shh, the movie is starting. Yep. So is that on YouTube as well, or where do you find that? That's right now. It's on SoundCloud, but oh, yeah. it might not. It might not be there for much longer. Well, yeah, SoundCloud, like you said, but is there a, 
like you're not backing that up to YouTube or nothing like that, or uh, at least not yet. No. Oh, is it because it's just literally a commentary track that you play? Like if somebody, if somebody has a movie, they'll just play the commentary. Track yeah, over basically. It? Yeah, we want we want them to be able to look on a phone or whatever while they're watching the TV. I gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Although a phone, um, the speakers aren't too loud on those things, so no. <laughs> right. Okay. So I want to thank you for coming on. Of course, I want to thank everybody for listening to another episode of the DP and Me podcast. Of course, we are listening to it on whether platform you're listening to it on, but you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Podomatic, and YouTube. Just look for the Down Phoenix Show or DP and Me, and you're going to find the podcast wherever your preferred way to listen to it. Um, but uh, that was Chris, the old ass retro gamer. He is the me for this episode, and I'm Dow Phoenix. Out. I'd like to thank you guys for listening to the DP and Me podcast with Dow Phoenix. This was episode three with Christopher Pico, the old ass retro gamer. I'd like to thank him for joining us on today's show. All music that was played throughout this episode is provided by Technoax. TechnoX provides royalty-free music on YouTube. You can find it at youtube.com slash T-E-K-N-O-A-X-E. Check the links in the description if you want to find other ways to listen to the podcast. But that's all I've got time for now. Until then, down Phoenix. Ow.